I want you to wrap up uh, something that I and en we ended with the last time, um, which is the kind of the derivation of the. Uh, I guess I don't have to go through here. Derivation of the then. Um, Derivation of the driven and damped simple harmonic oscillator, and I think I can use my one note. So I went through that derivation, and we redrived the the, um, the amplitude formula that your textbook does. Got the exact same formula, and the thing that um, I was um, um, <laughs> well, I got confused on, <laughs> and I wasn't quite sure uh, was um, what's the deal with this. Um, it's a phase factor because I thought the phase factor was going to come out a particular way and it didn't because um, I think uh, what I was uh, expecting it to do was on resonance. Um, so when omega is equal to the, the natural frequency of oscillation, um, I wanted the feed to be zero. Um, I, I don't know. That's the intuition I had. But when you look at this expression for phi, you see that um, that it doesn't happen that way. And I spent some time looking at the formula to see did I swap the real part and imaginary part, and um, and I didn't see it. And you know, here plugging in value of omega for omega naught, you do get. Um, you know, tangent of phi going to infinity, which means phi is approaching uh, 90 degrees. So what I thought would be um, good to do, uh, yeah, and that's me explaining what I was confused about. <laughs> so what I thought would be good to do is uh, do this um, uh, do this uh, numerically. And we can see if uh, just my um, intuition was just in the wrong place, or if I did actually make a mistake in trying to do this analytically. We'll see. I actually haven't done this before, so however way it comes out, it'll be a total surprise to me, so, <laughs> as well as probably to you. So um, so what I'm going to use uh, for this exercise is actually something I have already done a demo of before. So um, this is something I've already done before in a different context. Uh, so a uh, few semesters ago, I've done this um, demonstration of analysis of simple harmonic oscillator with a computer algebra system. And I've actually done uh, solving for simple harmonic oscillator motion, even the driven dent one with the sage math. Um, and uh, so, so today, I will be just uh, doing it uh, in a slightly different way. So before, uh, here I actually didn't work out any analytical expressions myself because um, uh, back then, um, I didn't introduce complex exponentials, so I was basically doing the difficult math using computer algebra system. Um, now, I guess we are doing that too, but let me do it differently this way so that it's not just a complete repeat of what's already there. Uh, so one different way I can do is I can actually use the equation of motion that I wrote that I wrote down for this particular system. The the, um, the one using complex exponential for the driving force. So we'll do it that way. Um, and uh, and we can also demonstrate some of the things that, um, you know, before I was pretending to do and then never ended up doing, we can actually now do. So, um, so let me actually start a new uh, page for this because... Um, uh, <laughs> because it's substantial enough of a topic. Uh, let's see, can I save this? Uh, let me. Then, driven and then the symbol of harmonic oscillator analysis with the complex exponentials. So, um, now I don't do this often enough that I forget a lot of what I taught myself when I was doing that other demo before, but let me try to remember. Um, so first I need to um, uh, define the variables I'm going to be using. So uh, x is a built-in variable, but let me um, declare it anyway. Uh, doesn't hurt anything. And um, I guess, uh, let's see, do I want to keep it okay? Um, let me actually not keep it okay, because at the end of last week's session, I did um, work out an expression for the k in terms of the, the natural frequency of oscillation. So we'll use that. That'll help keep the units a little bit simpler. 
So the natural frequency of oscillation is given by square root of k over m. So in terms of this and the mass, k is equal to uh, mass times natural frequency of oscillation squared. So we'll be using that symbol instead of k. So omega naught, um, b damping factor, we still need that, um, t for time, and f naught for amplitude of the driving force, omega for the frequency of driving force, uh, I still need the mass, and I think that's everything. And if I forgot something, I can um, do that again. And um, I want to uh, define x as a, a function. I think this is how you do it. Uh, let me see. Okay, yeah, x is a function of time, great. <laughs> um, so now we can write down our equation of motion. The equation of motion is um, minus, so instead of k, I'm going to use m times omega naught squared times x as a function of time minus b times the derivative of x with respect to time, first order, plus the the amplitude of the driving force, and I'm now going to use the complex exponential. Instead of using the, the driving force expression that your textbook had, I will just keep with the complex exponentials. Exponential of, uh, I think I is the right, uh, let me see. Um, let's see, I squared. Yeah, yeah, okay, I is the right <laughs> symbol for uh, imaginary number in this system. I times the driving frequency times a uh, time. Uh, that's equal to mass times second order derivative of uh, position as a function of time. So I think that's a correct expression. Let's see. Uh, yeah, that's my differential equation. So when we are doing this with a computer algebra system, you know, I uh, came up with a guess that I plugged in. Now we don't have to. We have a proper um, computer algebra system. We can solve this uh, ordinary differential equation. Think the um, function I use need to use is something called the D solve. Let me just double check because <laughs> again, I don't do this often enough. I forget this by the time I need to do it again. Um, yeah, so. The first uh, argument is differential equation, and I need the, in the, the dependent variable, that's my x, and the initial conditions. Let me just uh, type this in. So uh, my solution will be this solve. Differential equation, that's my equation of motion. Dependent variable, that's x. Um, initial conditions, ah, um, I think I do want to specify them. So, for the second order equation, okay, I'm specifying initial x. Let's say it's starting at zero position. Initial, oh, sorry, uh, x is actually t, zero time, uh, zero position. And then first order derivative, let's say it's starting out at rest. Um, so that, you know, it's a kind of the, the ordinary situation where you have a system at rest, you apply a driving force, and that, you know, it drives everything else from there. Okay, that's the initial conditions. Independent variable, that's going to be t. Uh, I think that's everything. Let's see uh, what it will do if I do this. So it should give me a complex solution um, if it does give me a solution. Uh, let's see, what is it? Um, uh, I think I need to, yeah, give it some... So it wants me to tell it um, yeah, uh, how the, some of the parameters work out because the kind of the solution regime that you will be in will depend uh, on the situation. So let's say, yeah, so example of legal syntax is that all right? We'll just use it because I think uh, um, this, uh, so this quantity will be positive if it, your damping factor is so small. And that kind of sounds like uh, what I want. Oops. Uh, Oops, um, sorry, I'm trying to remember insert above, okay. <laughs> um, so let me do the uh, that assumed thing. Um, let's see if that will be enough. Um, yeah, 
um, solve again. Is it? It has to go through a few of these. Um, now is yeah okay yeah. So me being a human being would have some yeah of course that's a positive. What are you talking about? But the computer algebra system being computer algebra system, it one it doesn't know the physical meaning of mass and um, all these symbols. So all this could potentially be a complex number for it knows. So I do need to say that this is positive. All right. See okay it got me a solution. So this solution should now be a complex expression. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not going to be dealing with this, um, you know, in this uh, algebraic form. This is one of the few situations where I would say, okay, just plug in the numbers, don't uh, work with the algebraic expression. So let me substitute in some of the quantities. So I'm going to say my omega naught is equal to 1. So I'm working in, I'm going to be working in a special unit system where my natural frequency of natural frequency of oscillation is one um, in this unique uh, unit system. Um, and let me say my mass is also one. Um, and I think this uh, having fixed uh, natural frequency of oscillation, setting the mass basically sets uh, what the uh, spring constant of the system is. And uh, because I want uh, this assumption to be true, let's say b is uh, some small number, 0 0.01 in this unit system. So that should uh, simplify a bit. There are still some symbols left. Let's see. We have f naught and omega. Oh, wow. Omega to the 34th power. I, I have no idea what it's doing. <laughs> All right. Um, so... Um, so let's say f naught is some small number, um, 0 0.1. Because in uh, most the situations with the, uh, the driven and damped simple harmonic oscillator, the driving force is usually small. And when you're on resonance, you'll build up amplitude from over many cycles. So, all right. Let's see. Put in f naught. And I think if the only thing it depends on now is omega and time, then we'll be good. So there's t there. Let's try plugging in omega and um, just to, uh, let's see, omega of zero, uh, which is, um, you know, not a, um, which is completely weird, uh, frequency, frequency to be driving in there. Um, okay, yeah, time is, the only thing, um, so omega 0 0.1, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so with this, now we can do the thing that um, before we are pretending that we would do and we never ended up doing. So before, when we were working with this you know, analytical method, so when I put in this complex driving force expression, what I promised was that whenever we want actual result, we'll put this through a real part. And I, I even insinuated that I was just uh, uh, pretending to do it and I would never do it and I never did it that day. Um, but today, uh, because when you, so we're gonna be want to, wanting to plot this function as a function of time to look at the behavior of the system under this scenario. Now, the challenge in doing that. So for example, I can try plotting it now. If I try to plot it now, which uh, I don't know the <laughs> syntax for plot function, plot, um, yeah, I think uh, it's gonna be plot this function and then uh, t from, let's say zero to 100. Um, fail to evaluate function at, yeah. Um, Wait, how does it? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, um, so I'm trying to plot a complex number and it's not designed to do that. So it's telling me use absolute or real part. So even if I had, uh, you know, forgotten <laughs> my promise, I, this will now remind me, oh yeah, I have a complex number. In order to plot it, I have to take the real part only to plot. I mean, I don't have to. I can also take the imaginary part. So I can take the real part, uh, imaginary part, 
or I can take the absolute value. Um, it, regardless of what you do, the what's um, remaining constant is that uh, because this is a complex number, two parameters, you can't really plot it with a single plot. So um, uh, let me just go with what I promised at the beginning of the other time and just to take the real part because that was what we were always planning on doing when we expressed our driving force as a complex function. The promise from the beginning was if we ever need the actual values, the, the you know real number values, we can just take the real part and the mathematical operations we've done will have uh, taken care. We've will have been careful so that when we just take the real part, it's mathematically sound. Um, mainly, what that means is I uh, made sure I didn't multiply by uh, multiply two complex functions together. That's the one thing you can't do uh, when you are working with a complex ex uh, complex exponentials to handle oscillatory phenomena. So, um, okay, we see something that, um, all right, and, uh, it, it doesn't look like a simple harmonic oscillator, and I think I have a guess why. So this is our natural frequency of oscillation. We are really far from resonance. So it makes sense to me that uh, this is oscillating relatively, and, um, and yeah, th this is larger, uh, the longer period oscillation, that's my driving force. And this is smaller oscillation is my natural frequency of oscillation. I think that's uh, how it uh, makes sense. Let me move this to 0 0.2 and see what we get. Okay, it's getting more interesting. I think my driving force is too big. Let me make it smaller. So yeah, we are still way off resonance. So our amplitude is pretty small. Let me get closer to resonance, 0 0.8. It's 0 0.2 away from resonance. Now it's a 0 0.02. Okay, let me go to 0 0.9. Okay, uh, 0 0.04, it's double. Now when I'm at 0. Point, well, when I'm at 1, oh, we can double check the formula that was in the textbook and um, the one we derived last time. So this is right now on resonance. So the amplitude we get, 1, apparently, that should match uh, what we are expecting from um, our amplitude formula. So um, our driving force is 0 0.01, and this is 0 because we are on resonance, and B is 0 0.01 um, squared, so uh, 10 to the minus 4 times 1, okay, so under the square root it's a 10 to the minus 4, so after square root it's 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 2, um, dividing 0.01, that's 1. Yeah, so it's just a, I don't know, conspiracy of <laughs> numbers. It's not always going to be 1 like this. Like if this was 0.05, then, um, then you know, it would be that. Um, so, but it is, uh, I guess it is linear in driving force amplitude. So, so okay, that's fun. <laughs> Um, now, that's not the main thing that I wanted to do this for. So, you know, we can play with this like uh, forever. There isn't really an ending point at which um, we would end. Now, one of the interesting things um, using this method is that uh, we can actually get the transients. So, for example, if we are relatively off resonance, like say 1.2, and um, if our uh, driving force is large enough, or maybe, um, let me do it this way. We are on resonance. And if, I, so here I think our driving force is big enough to just uh, get to the equilibrium amplitude right away. But let's say we were driving with a, a really small force. Then, oh, it just stays there. Maybe, um, what I need to kind of figure out, um, I think it might be that I might need a, a smaller damping term so that the kind of the energy can build over more cycles. And let me see if I can plot this over a longer time. No. I don't know. This is a little worrisome to me. Um, let me try plotting absolute value because it's possible that 
Mm. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't worry about this then. Just to get to the thing that I was gonna get at. Because the thing that worries me is that um, doesn't have any kind of building time. Because uh, we set our initial conditions so that um, because uh, the solution, uh, let me just, that, so that's uh, x as a function of time. And um, so the solution at, um, you know, t equals zero should be zero. Oh wait, it's not. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Because that was our initial condition. And it's not zero. Okay, that is worrisome. <laughs> we probably didn't use our initial conditions. Um, um, uh, I guess... Uh, Let me see what it does if I don't specify. I don't know. <laughs> it, I'll just say it is. Uh, um, uh, let me just do this um, without the initial conditions and see what it does. It's, oh, wait. Uh, so, I bar. Okay, it did something. Let's see. Yeah, now it has integration constants that it should have. So that means it did use our initial condition. Uh, y gave me a solution that doesn't um, obey that initial condition? I don't know. Uh, it, it's possible that this is not a physically possible initial condition. Although, no, it's a boundary value. I can I have freedom to just specify it, um, so it's worrisome to me. But that's not what I uh, the main thing I want you to handle. So let me just let the sleeping dog lie and um, do something different. So we have the um, the solution that we can plot, and uh, what I want you to uh, overlay on top of this plot is our uh, driving force. So we can think of the way to do it is do it as a list. And um, so my driving force will be F naught times exponential of I omega T. And we'll substitute in the, use the same substitution function here. Uh, substitute in all these. Some of these are uh, redundant, or let me get rid of the redundant ones. Uh, I don't need omega naught, m, or b. So, and I still need to take the real part only. And let's see what that plot looks like. Because the main thing I want you to, um, oops, oh. M main thing I want you to do here is I want you to see if, um, our driving force, which is in green, uh, is going to be, uh, and let me make it be smaller. Oops. Um, sorry, I made it be larger. Why is this? Um, okay, this doesn't, this is a little bit weird. Um, let me see. Did I specify B wrong? Um, so in the equation back up there, I had a minus kx minus um, B times um, the thing that's added to me is that 
when the b is smaller, like if b is zero, the amplitude should uh, approach infinity. Uh, well, it can't actually be zero. <laughs> that will cause issues with the calculation. Um, Wait, what is it doing? Oh. This is not that small of a value. I don't think that should result in division by zero. Um, mm. Not sure. <laughs> So when I make a B larger, um, okay, so at some large enough value that is causing the amplitude to go down, okay, that's good. But, um, so uh, back to the original problem I was worried with. Um, when B is, uh, so from here, as I make a bit smaller, that should uh, make the amplitude larger. But for some reason, it's not doing that. Like uh, here, the amplitude is 1, which is the one value we checked. And when I make it this 0 0.05, then OK, it's doubling. That's good. When I make it 0 0.03, OK, it, good. I think. Um, so at 0.01, it should have been, I think, uh, according to this formula here, at 0.01, um, it should have been 10 times. So that is actually a little bit odd. Because at um, 0.1, it's uh, this. Then when it's uh, 0.05, it should have doubled, which it did. And when I half it again, that it should now have quadrupled and uh, and it didn't um, it's running into some issue whenever i think uh, i don't know it might be some numerical calculation thing like at, um so up to point and this is much larger than it's supposed to be like compared to this um so there might be some singularity somewhere i don't know i'm gonna just stay away from those and stay around like between 0.1 to um, where the value I get is reasonable. That's what I was expecting. And 0 0.01, again, what I was expecting. And 0 0.05, what I was expecting around the 0.2. Okay, that's all good. <laughs> so we'll just stay there. And um, we'll just make the force. So that it's comparable. We'll make it, um, we'll multiply this number by 10. I think that'll uh, work by 20. And we'll stay around here. And what I want you to check was back to our original question of what was confusing me about this phase factor is if it's true that the phase is actually um, out of phase, which it might be. So let's see. Um, we'll plot from, let's say, um, 10 point, 12.5 to um, like 25, so 12.5 to 25. I think that'll catch a few cycles. Or um, 14, 15, 13, okay, I can plot it from 13. So we are starting at what is basically, um, you know, the sine wave. And um, this does look like something that's uh, about 90 degrees out of phase. Um, not exactly, but close. So let's uh, um, let's just uh, test out this formula. So if this uh, formula for tangent phi is correct, then as uh, omega goes to zero, um, tangent phi should go to zero. So at very small, um, oh wait, I, so I think I do have to keep changing this. Um, so if my driving frequency is really small, like 0 0.1, then uh, the response x of t and the, the driving force should be more or less um, is in sync. And let's see. Um, 
So zero to one hundred. Okay, um, and I think these are the transients. So let me plot it from like a hundred and on, hundred to two hundred. Then yeah, the transients have died away, and the response is now just uh, um, the just the, uh, the the the. So let me stop multiplying this by twenty. Um, responses or not at all. Um, well, well, I do need them to be a little bit different so that we can tell them apart. But they are basically in um, in sync. They are um, moving at the same. Um, so when the driving force goes up, the response goes up. When driving force goes down, the response goes down. And if we move this out, to, you know, from thousand to eleven hundred, then you know those small oscillations, the transients have died away, and this is just following the driving response. Exactly what we want. Exactly what we would predict. Good. So, okay, uh, let's uh, make omega something in between, like um, maybe omega of uh, half of the, the resonance frequency. Then, um, then these should start to go a little bit out of phase. Let's see. And, um, Oh, it might be on some kind of uh, resonance. Let me not make the, um, <laughs> let me stay away from the integer um, differences, 0.4 maybe. Uh, it's doing something weird. Um, by weird, I mean it's, uh, um, oh, wait, I, I know why. I should have changed the both numbers. Um, Okay, uh, so let's go back to, you know, long enough time later so that the transients have died out. Um, and they are still right in phase. And I don't think that's uh, what I wanted to see. Um, omega being... So if omega is 0.4, yeah, it shouldn't be zero. Oh, but um, there's this uh, factor B. I think I've forgotten about that. Um, so, so, so let me do a slight bit of a rewrite. Um, so tangent V is equal to um, I want to rewrite k in terms of the the natural frequency. Then it'll be m omega naught squared minus um, omega squared b times omega. So think away from where this is equal to that. I can treat the denominator as constant of a sort and the numerator um, will so with b being small um, so there will be a limit to how far off resonance it can go because um, So, uh, how how you know how out of sync they can get? Because the maximum for phi will be basically dictated by that b. So, um, so let me um, uh, let me actually calculate the the numerical value here of tangent phi. So right now my b is 0 0.05 times omega 0 0.4, or let me write it this way, b times omega, I have the symbols, uh, m times omega naught, or omega naught squared minus omega squared. So substitute in b is equal to 0 0.05, omega is equal to 0 0.4, omega naught is uh, and m is equal to 1. So, yeah, so if that's a tangent phi, then 
um, arc tangent of that um, multiply by uh, 180 degree time divided by pi yeah only 1.36 degrees no wonder I can't quite see it there so I think the way to do it would be to um, so if I make so let's just uh, so anywhere below um, the resonance frequency they will be kind of um, um, in the same phase like I can go up to 0 0.9 and it'll still be the case that uh, they'll be kind of in sync because um, it'll still be the case that they are in sync, more or less, um, because of the small b. So here, if I put in, I think I can begin to see the difference a little bit. Um, so with the omega of 0 0.9, the yeah, angular difference 13.3 degrees, and I can convince myself into believing, yeah, that's a 13.3 degree difference in phase between these two oscillatory phenomena. So what I was really interested in seeing is what happens as this approaches resonance. What my analytical expression claims is that as it approaches resonance, like right on resonance, this should uh, approach infinity, uh, positive infinity. So, um, so tangent, the angle should approach uh, 90 degrees. Let's give it a try. So um, 9, 5, 9, 5. And I think I can just leave it here. This is a good view. Uh, maybe a little bit less. And um, and uh, multiply force by some factor. Um, I don't know. Three or four. So that it, it can kind of keep up. Um, yeah, it's beginning to get out of phase more and more. Let me put it to 9.9. Nine. And... And uh, right exactly on resonance, what does actually happen is they are 90 degrees out of phase. And, um, and uh, what you see here will be uh, look a little bit different from if I plotted this from 0 to 30, I think. Because 0 to 30, um, the kind of the shape you see here, it's a little bit different. Because here right now you have a little bit of transients. So when you've gone out to, you know, thousand seconds, you know, thousand and two thousand thirty. Uh, so here is where you've waited long enough. All the transients have died out. And the only thing you have remaining is, uh, why is my, was it always this small? Um, sorry, one second. Um, this response feels a small, no, no, I guess that's right. Point two is, I think that is the right value with uh, damping factor of 0.05. Yeah, okay. It's just confusing myself. Yeah, so um, so when you've weighted out the transients, then, um, then what you see here is right. So yeah, on resonance, uh, your response is 90 degrees out of phase with your... Um, driving force. It's not something that I would have expected, but um, calculation shows that's right. <laughs> so why am I to say that's wrong? <laughs> um, and uh, now once you go over the resonance, something interesting does happen. I think uh, it's going to now go out of phase. So um, like if I'm at 0.01 driving, then um, because I'm now noticing that denominator will be negative. So with a negative denominator, this will give you something that's uh, out of phase. So you can see this uh, going past the 90 degree uh, phase, and now it's at something like this. Um, then, yeah, it's beginning to be out of phase, as in when the force is uh, at maximum, your response is actually at the other extreme. And, um, and let's say you are um, out of the at the higher frequency at you know 1.1 1 .1, um, like 10 percent over the the resonance frequency then you are what the math would have said is because your b is so small uh, so let me put the numbers in here 
So because your b is so small, when your omega is 1.1, um, it would minus 14.6. Yeah, yeah, I guess I can imagine that, yeah. So mine, oh, um, yeah, you have an issue because you're trying to get a, so I can't do arctangent anymore because the, the angle value is actually, um, you know, it, it's in the it's in the second quadrant. So doing arctangent won't give me the right number. Um, so what I can do is, uh, well, I, can I? Yeah, I, I don't think I can even multiply this 180 divided by pi. Because if I do that, yeah, it'll just give me that. Um, well, so, because, well, so if you recognize that this is in your in the second quadrant, um, you know, positive sign, negative cosine, then what you can do <laughs> is to do 180 degree plus um, the 180 divided by pi uh, times arc tangent of that. So you have to do a bunch of uh, convergence. So 165 degrees with all the corrections. Uh, that's at 1.1. Now if you're a little bit farther away, then it should be close to now 180 degrees. Um, so a little bit farther away at 1.3, pretty close to 180 degrees. That 5 degree difference, you probably can't visually see. But that makes a sense to me. And I do think I remember um, this from um, upper division classical mechanics um, that when you have a driven oscillator that uh, there's a certain shift in behavior that occurs around the resonance that when you are driving above the resonance frequency then um, then the oscillation is at like this uh, now that I see it numerically it doesn't sound surprising <laughs> but it's the kind of thing that you actually have to you know um, drive. It, it's, I think uh, most of us wouldn't have um, intuitive feel for how a driven oscillator behaves. Um, it's one of the interesting um, uh, setup where it does things that you wouldn't always expect. Um, we got five minutes. Um, maybe I'll just play a little bit more with the sage math. Because um, the thing that that I'm still um, flabbergasted with is that um, this does weird things when, well, I guess so one of the things is, um, so in the parameters where it was behaving fine, um, it was doing this thing um, there. At like a t equals zero, it should have been like a zero, or um, like or if I take the solution and if I took the derivative of it with respect to t, um, like first order, that's the velocity, and like a velocity should have been zero at the initial condition, and it's not giving me that. <laughs> um, and I'm not quite sure why it's not doing that. Uh, I gave it initial conditions. I wonder if it makes a difference if I specify my initial condition. So time is a real number, um, but this is my imaginary number. So does it make a difference if I specify it this way? No, no difference. I, I, I'm confused uh, why it um, it's just blatantly giving me something that I didn't ask. Uh, okay, I guess I can do this because this is done in Sage Math. I can actually uh, redo this in real function really quickly. So I can uh, take this and replace it with a, its a real version, which is cosine of omega times t. I can just do that. And let's see uh, what it'll do. So I shouldn't be giving it complex initial conditions. Um, okay, it solved something. 
let's look at first the solution itself. At time equals zero, yeah, all the parameters where it should be zero. Okay, gave me zero. And let's uh, take the derivative um, with respect to t. Okay, that matches the initial condition. All right, that's doing what it was supposed to. So, um, so let's uh, just replot the things that we were plotting before. So um, we'll change this to cosine of omega t. And we don't have to take real part anymore <laughs> because we've given up and gone to real functions. Let's see if that's any better. So CH math might be doing something when it's a complex function that um, it shouldn't be doing, <laughs> maybe. Um, now, what I can show, I think, is that um, all the all, all the results that we were looking at, they still remain valid. So for example, if my omega is like, um, so let's say on resonance. Um, so this is where we are getting amplitude of one. We still should get amplitude of one, but uh, oh, now we are getting a better time behavior. So it's a slowly building of amplitude over time, which is totally what I would have expected that our complex version just didn't. I don't know why. <laughs> um, uh, it, it might have been doing something weird with the time. Uh, it, sometimes it does that. So, yeah, it, good. It's building up to 1.0 amplitude over some time. And let me see if now that weird behavior with the damping factor is gone. Uh, so when I decrease the damping factor by factor of 10, um, yeah, this is probably so, still building up. So let me go to 10,000. Uh, yeah, yeah. When it builds up the amplitude, it builds up to 10. Great. And when my damping factor is um, like 10 times less, then yeah, it's, this is probably still building amplitude. So I need a longer amount of time to let it settle. And yeah, this looks totally as what you'd expect. So um I gotta research more <laughs> why uh, CH math when it's solving complex uh, ODE, it does weird stuff. Um, but um, but none of the uh, results that we talked about uh, needs to change because uh, I just you know verify. Oh oh, and I guess uh, in in the spirit of verifying, I can uh, verify the the thing that uh, was the most interesting thing, meaning um, so. That, that it right on resonance, yeah, it's 90 degrees out of phase. And when it's a little bit below resonance, uh, like 0 0.8, then it's more or less in phase, more or less in phase. And when it's a little bit over resonance, then it's uh, completely out of phase, 180 degrees out of phase. Yeah, That result still holds <laughs> whether you solve it with the real functions or complex functions. So that at least uh, that result we can still rely on, which you know you would have guessed. That's uh, what we had with the uh, the the analytical expression that we derived using complex exponentials.